Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 163, The Eyes Have It, our first AMA of 2022. I am Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Thanks for joining us, especially those of you here live in our chat room. Now, there's lots going on this week, both Sean and I, uh, but we didn't want to miss another week. So today we decided to go with an AMA where we'll be answering questions live from our chat room. After that, I've got a quick review of a king-size majestic wolf puzzle from Unidragon. And finally, I've got quite a few games to talk about in our week in review, including three games off the pile of shame, including WWE Superstar Showdown, Dune Imperium, and Scorpius Freighter. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a comment on our best mystery games topic. Phil Hatfield writes, I enjoyed Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted House. I hope they make more with Scooby-Doo. Mm -hmm. I would also highly suggest Watson and Holmes. It's an elegant step forward from the 20, 221B Baker Street, and I've heard say, some say it's like a shortened, more focused Sherlock Holmes consulting detective agency. Uh, it is all mystery and quite deductive in nature and offers multiple scenarios. Additionally, there is a new version of Watson and Holmes in the works coming this year, in fact. Now, that's not the first recommendation we've gotten for Watson and Holmes from that show. Uh, actually, Jeff, who's in the chat, was another one who brought that one up. It does sound like this definitely deserved a spot on the list, even though I didn't see it on too many top lists. But at least we know there are fans of the Bellhop who are fans of that game. Indeed. Now, next up, a comment from one of our Bellhop's tabletop segments when Mo was sharing his thoughts on the Hero Quest, Crest re, Hero Quest reprint. Patrick writes, rulebook typos, not being able to fit the expansion in base box, bad insert, soft plastic. Ugh, you pretty much validated my reasoning for not backing Hero Quest. I'll wait for a blowout sale or a 2.0 version. Yeah, I can totally see you waiting for a sale on this one. Um, actually, it was on sale yesterday as part of the Amazon Buy 2, Get 1 Free Max and Match sale. Though I think Patrick's probably hoping for a better deal than Buy 2, Get 1 Free. Um, as for a 2.0, I, I don't expect that. Like, how long did it take to even get a reprint? And the fact it's in the hands of Hasbro and Hasbro Pulps, I don't think we can expect a, a, an improved Hero Quest anytime soon. Now, what I'm actually hoping for myself is more expansion content because there was stuff that I was never able to get back in the days that was out there. The two expansions Games Workshop put out, the, the Elf and the Barbarian Quest pack, I would love to get copies of those. And then there was like an Ogre pack that was only out in the EU. I would love to see that stuff come out as well as the stuff that Games Workshop was working on that didn't come out. I would love to see that. That's what I'd like to see from Pulse is more expansion content. And then maybe, just maybe, some new content. Like, give us something brand new for Hero Quest. I would love to see that. That'd be a shock, but maybe. Uh, also, Jeff in the chat room po points out that the new Watson and Holmes is not a reprint. It's actually a sequel. Okay. So, even more exciting. I hope standalone, not just an expansion. Now, next, Brock Wager, uh, Wager uh, commented on our most recent article about getting games to the table right away to say, this article is great. Would have been nice to have read something like it, oh, say, three or four years ago before we started the tradition of tr cracking open a new game and learning it at the club that night. Well, thanks, Brock. And well, hopefully this can help you going forward. Well, Brock also commented on our topic from last episode, where we talked about our good price to bad game ratio, as did many other people. Here's some of those comments, starting with Brock's. Depends if bad means that I didn't like it, but it's $5 on sale, or if bad means that reviews aren't stellar, or it hasn't won the approval of the BGG hive mind. In the latter case, it all depends on if it looks interesting or not. I did buy Seafall for $30 just to check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's 15 to 20 at Winners or a garage sale, I'll take a chance on almost anything. I convinced my wife to buy me the Titanic board game for Christmas. It was $15 because I like the designer and it was actually a pretty decent game. Nothing special, but solid. 
unlike the boat. <laughs> now, Board Game Bollocks writes, Gen 7 is £9.99, and I'm still not interested. If they were giving it away, I still probably wouldn't take it, as space in my games room is more expensive than that. Fair. Now, Dexter M. Vorse says, if it's not going to get played, then not even free is going to make me take it home. Chris Groff writes, even for free, I wouldn't pick up a game I'm not interested in. All right. And Jay Behrens writes, since I'm trying to thin out my collection, even if it was free, I wouldn't want it. A lot of people with uh, some pretty <laughs> full game rooms, it sounds yes. like. Now, Ian Borchart writes, I'm afraid fire sales are my weakness, as I tend to go look for something to buy, even if it ends up being incredibly terrible. <laughs> Sometimes I'm lucky, and an unknown game is reasonable. Sometimes. I don't really research games before I buy all that much in the normal course. Wow. If it sounds potentially interesting, I'll buy it. And I buy a lot of games on Kickstarter, where it is generally the hopes and dreams of the designer that sell me, and where the final result is unknown at times. Fair. And finally, The Cult of Pop says, Available space in my apartment influences whether I'll buy ga worse games or not. Well, thanks everyone for the great feedback and interaction on this topic. That was actually only a small sampling of some of the stuff we did receive on this one. I got to say, I'm surprised by the number of people saying no way, even if it's free. Like there's no low price, even free, that would get me to take a game I'm not already interested in. Though I am also glad that there are some people out there that succumb to the good deal. And it's worked out well for them sometimes. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, game or game night questions. So most weeks we pick a question that someone sent to us by emailing questions at tabletopbellhop.com or filling out the form on our website, which you can find by clicking on Ask the Bellhop at the top of the page. This week, though, both Sean and I have a lot going on and didn't really have the time to do the research and pre-planning that's required for a full topic discussion. So we're taking the easy way out and hosting an AMA. Between health matters, sales, and other jobs, it's been a rough start to the year, even two months in. So a nice chat with our guests and a free forum discussion is always good. And in a way, I'm glad because I was thinking we haven't done one of these in quite a few months. And I know some people really do enjoy this format. And I know I do, and not just because it's less work after the fact, but also I love being able to interact with our chat room live. Indeed, we always seem to get some questions which make us work for it and <laughs> really think like that what board game would you be question from a year or so ago. Oh, someone's going to ask us to re re revisit <laughs> that one and see if it's changed. Now, as for this AMA, we are going to be taking questions from our chat room here on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, for those of you listening or watching. Um, for the you folk in the library, li library, wow, <laughs> I'm doing great. For you folk in the lobby, feel free to ask anything you want, gaming related or not. Well, to give people the chance to get some questions in, we've got one saved from the feedback session section from Bob okay. Lai about the topic of how low a price has to be before we take a chance on a game. Bob asks, tangentially related, have you ever bought a game on the bubble and been genuinely genuinely surprised by the product? It's overall gameplay or concept. All right. I should have done some research going through my board game geek list, but I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I knew this software was coming up, but I still didn't prep for it, which is just silly on me. Um, one of the things we are talking about this now to give people in the chat time to get your questions in. So please send in those questions. All right. So back in the day, um, Boxing Day at Hugen and Munin, they had a bunch of fantasy flight silver line games on sale and they're 10 bucks each and at the time i had money from christmas and i probably had a gift certificate at that time and i bought all of them i literally bought every single one and then there was a whole bunch from uh, geo chicks which i'm not sure if that's how i'm pronounced but it's like geo chicks dot geochicks or something dot de and i bought a bunch of those out of those games most were flops there there weren't a lot of great ones but then there were some awesome ones like citadels which, yes, I know I complain about how I don't like social deduction, and I'll admit, Citadels has dropped for me, but I had no clue I was getting such a great, um, I don't even know how to describe that game. You're like city building while backstabbing each other. 
and trying to collect tokens. It's like a race to victory points, but there's some social deduction because you're going to put your warrior down hoping no one else played an assassin to kill him. So it's not like the straight up bluffing where someone's taking on a roll. It's more of a like like poker like bluffing. So that was one. Um, another one was there was a warehouse sale here, like a, one of those shops that suddenly opens up and has tons of stuff that they obviously got off a boat somewhere and are just selling it all off. One of those huge places. And they had a whole bunch of Z-Man games and other games for five bucks each and like seven for 30 or something stupid like that. And out of that, we got a ton of great games. Um, some of the best ones were the Zavendar game. So there was Mines of Zavendar Dwar, and some Dwarves of Zavendar, I think is the other name. I'm not sure if Deanna is listening or doing something else. She might be able to remember some of these. But those ended up being really good. I still have one of them. And another one we actually keep for our white elephants every year because someone has to put it in the white elephant every year. And I was the one that got it last year, so I had to put it back in because it's just kind of a running joke. Um, I got Stefan Feld's The Speaker Stat that way. There was a Great Wall of China game, which I think was just called Great Wall. It's not the new one that everyone's going nuts over. But it, there was a uh, going cuckoo. Yeah. Going cuckoo over. That's probably still not it. I'm failing at my non-ableist word. Sorry. Going bonkers over. There we go. Failed there. Um, which had little plastic walls you put on that were color-coded. And it was an action selection game where everyone had these things you put down. Oh, it was Gnomes of Zavendar. There you go. I was thinking dwarves. Gnomes of Zavendar. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and like that was actually really good. Um, the Vulgaria Eloquentia cost me three dollars, and this is a heavy euro where you're developing the English language, and it's a cube pusher where you're doing an action selection. So I have definitely gotten lucky. That said, there's more bombs than there were good. Like out of those uh, Rails of New England, that was another one from Z Man that I got in Last Train to Nuremberg, all like actually really solid train games. But then for every one of those, there's a Senator, which is one of the worst games I've ever played. Fantasy Flight, excuse me, Fantasy Flight put out this game called Senator. Everyone we played it with hated it. Um, Surprised Jamie's not in the chat tonight, but I'm sure Jamie would be shouting Senator at the top of his lungs for one of those terrible games we got as part of that sale. So definitely. Now, Sean, have you ever bought like a cheap game that just didn't work out or, or was better than you thought it would be? Um trying to think and not really um although i mean i suppose technically that uh uh that marvel uh strike force game not strike force but uh marvel yeah that was the one i was thinking possibly yeah, yeah. uh which was uh, a reason uh, there was more content in it now especially this was deeply discounted on sale yes. um which was why it's it's that it's a cheap game um but no it was there's a lot of content I and mean, it, it was remarkably solid uh i don't think it, it sunk in as well with my son as i'd hoped it would so it hasn't gotten back to the table as much but i was really surprised by how much there was in it yeah, though i think that's 60 dollars regular price so yeah. would it be worth picking up at full price uh you'd, yeah. be, you'd have to be a real fan i mean like it, if it's in the 50 that, to 60 yeah you'd have to be a real fan of that style of game and i think that was the thing with my son you know my son likes the marvel and stuff but the uh the the, the dudes on a map sort of skirmish concept wasn't really his thing nah not for him fair enough uh all right well next up we've got a question here from roger from the discord uh what are some of the weirdest games you've played and when does it get too weird to be fun i might save that one for a full topic at some point i think that'd be an interesting like top 10 top 20 at some point um weirdest games um the one behind poseidon's kingdom <laughs> So Poseidon's Kingdom, which unfortunately I'm getting rid of it, um, you've got this board that shows the sea, like waves going up on a beach, and you have really well-crafted ceramic playing pieces that look like various sea creatures that are very cute, and you then set up a wave, it's called, and it's this cardboard mechanism. That you put a bunch of dice on, then you tip the wave, which causes the dice to kind of tumble out, and depending on where they land, they're food for all these fish things. And then it's actually like a rondelle because you're going around the board trying to eat the things to defeat the evil octopus. And it's, it, it, it hits that too weird part. Like the wave is just too random. 
half the time the dice spill like right off the board because you tipped it too quick. And like I get the concept, but it was just like, just let me find a way to roll these instead of this stupid cardboard wave thing that's not that sturdy. And yes, the pieces are fantastic looking, but for the price of the game, it's it's like a gateway kids game that cost eighty dollars. Right. Like it's got the cute pieces, but then they're ceramic, which is awesome. And and I bought it because it was a really good sale. So kind of jumping back to the other question, but I, I did my research on this one, but this actually looks good. Um, I have no idea what it rates on Board Game Geek. Maybe that's something Sean can look up. But Poseidon's Kingdom is definitely one that was very strange and still fun for a while, but I just, it, it was too gimmicky. It was a bit too much. Yeah, I can't think of anything on my uh, uh, my list as somehow. My okay, so next would be Tower of Madness which is kerplunk with marbles that's Cthulhu and you're trying not to go insane and you're pulling out tentacles. And while well, the tentacles are just graphics because they're just kerplunk on the inside. And the problem with that one was that the fun part of the game is to pull out the marbles and then see if you go insane. Like that's what's fun. Well, tacked onto this was this Yahtzee like dice rolling game and a point scoring system based on what you rolled on the dice, and you only actually pulled things when you failed. So when you played well and won and played tactically, you no longer had got to do the fun thing, which just, it was just, poor, to me, poor design. Like, like there should have been, like, I don't know, like you wanted to fail at some point. You're like, okay, I've won. I have the most points at this point. I'm just not going to slot my dice properly in purpose. And I'm going to reroll so I fail just so I get to pull a thing and see if marbles fall. So that was another one. Um, Tragedy Looper is another because it's a, a versus game where you have one player being like the narrator in an anime mystery, generally murder. I think people die in all of them because it's that's why it's a tragedy. And you have the other players playing teenage investigators trying to figure out what the tragedy is. So you sit down, you play the game, and you have no idea what's happening. Like you can move around, you can talk to people, you can you can you can cheer people up, you can do some things, and eventually a tragedy happens, and you're like, oh, okay, that's what the tragedy is. And then it loops back to the beginning, and you play again. But now the characters know what the tragedy is, and they're trying to prevent it. And then they try to do the same thing, and if the tragedy happens, it loops back. And it just it's such an interesting concept of the whole Groundhog Day style time travel. But it is super fiddly and hard to learn because the actions are weird and you basically, it's a logic puzzle. So you need like a flow chart where you're keeping track of, okay, how many times did you cure up this person? Where did this person move? Okay, this person moved. They When, they, when you moved them here, no one died. So that must be a proper move. And like, it's just way too fiddly and weird. And, and trying to sell someone on this concept when it's not like a light, quick deduction game. Instead, it's this complicated token tracking, moving people on a board. And it's horrible to DM because if you screw something up, it can ruin the whole game. So that's another one. I'm um, trying to think of other weird games. Uh, 6.8 for Poseidon's Kingdom, by the way. 6 point? Is that's not bad. That's, yeah, that's, not, that, bad. that's not terrible. Uh, a lot of Eight people are saying it's too expensive. Would like all the... avoiding pulling a stick. See, the thing with that, it's not even a dexterity game. Yeah, it's for plunk. Bad. There's no dexterity. You just yep. pull a thing. There's literally no dexterity in that game. It's it's you're, You can't see the marbles. Like you can't, there's no way to make a logical choice. Yeah, the thing with, one of the big negatives about Poseidon's Kingdom is actually the price. They put the really nice components into it yeah, and jacked it's... the price up way too high for what the game what is. What it is, yeah. It's, it's a lighter kind of kids game. That's exactly my thoughts on it. Although interestingly, the weight is listed as 2.3 on per game. I, like I said, it's not a rolling move. Like it's yeah. it's you have, it's one of those, you have multiple characters you control. So when, when you have to decide which ones to move and you're also having to build up to fight this big boss at the end, like it, it's not a kid's game. It just looks, I don't know. It, it's semi gateway. I break it out, but it's terrible for audio. And we're also recording a podcast here. <laughs> Um, let me think. What else is weird? I'm, I'm looking. I'm hoping Deanna types something in the chat. I'm trying to think of weird games. Like Riff Raff is kind of weird because it's a wooden ship on a literal gimbal that you're stacking things on, and it's just the fact that it's like literally on a gimbal wandering around. Oh, there's a good one. See, I thought Deanna might help. Niagara. So here's a game that uses the box. You open it up. You flip the box over, and here you have the Niagara Falls. Right? And it's something nice and near dear to most of us. And on it, you put these like discs they're clear acrylic discs and you have a bunch of canoes and you put your canoes on and then your goal is to use your two canoes to go down the river as close to the falls edge as you can to 
to mine gems and then get them back to base camp. And the neat thing in this game is every round after you go, you slide a new acrylic disc on and it causes all the other discs to slide down the falls. And then at the end of the falls, there's a branch, a fork, and you never know which way the discs are going to go. And most of the time it goes this way, then this way, this way, then that way. And you can plan on that, but then every now and then you get two discs in a row. And if your canoe falls off in the end, you lose that canoe for so many times. And it's one of those games where it's everyone has perfect information where you have the numbers one through 10 and you watch what other people played to know which way they're going to go. So that one's a cool one. Deanna, Deanna's kicking butt here. Click Clack Lumberjack. It's a game where you put a bunch of tree trunks with bark on them and stack it up. And then you get this giant wooden axe. Like it's not giant, giant, but like for a board game component, it's, you know, tall as a Barbie, plastic axe, and you try to tap it just enough for the bark to fall off without knocking it over. That's a pretty unique one. It's been uh, renamed and rethemed as Bling Bling Gemstone, which I don't get as much because now it's like a tower of gems and you're trying to spelunk it off. I don't know, Click Clack Lumberjack or Tick Tock Woodman. That's another, there's multiple names for this one. Unfortunately, it's been pirated like crazy, so you can find lots of fake versions. Indeed, yeah. we've. And we've I gotta say, Go Cuckoo. Go Cuckoo's pretty dang weird. Although I don't I don't know if it's weird. I mean, it's essentially just a variant on pickup sticks. It's well, just yeah, you're sticks, but in a, it together. In a, it's just in, a, in, a, in the canister. Instead of dumping them out of the canister, you're, you're, playing, in the, you're playing in the canister. True, I guess. Uh, this would be a Mo I, question. Does anyone remember a space game where you flick your ship to move and the board was a puzzle board? No, no, no. Uh, Deanna's talking about flip ships. She's thinking, but flip ships, you literally like flip tiddly wings trying to get them in a box. There's no flicking, it's different. Right. Well, you're flicking upward, like you actually put them on an edge and you flip it up. Right. And yes, they rethemed it Space Invaders because everyone's like, it's Space Invaders. And they're like, well, let's get the license and really release it. Actually, it looks mm -hmm. really good. Um, flick your ship to move, and the board was a puzzle board. No, I do not. <laughs> um, all I can think of in that point is Space Cadets. Um, that's the only one I can think of in it. But like the, the flicking was only for the cannons. I don't remember one where you flick your ships. I just keep thinking like there's got to be, that's why I kind of want to do that. I might do this one as a topic at some point because it definitely seems like a, a topic where there's some good ones out there we're missing. Like I'm just not thinking. Although I don't think we, we've, I don't think we've found anything yet. That's too weird to be fun. Um, uh, what was the first one I mentioned? Now I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, we're we're this is why we're having an AMA tonight. <laughs> um, so another one is primordial soup, just because it's unique. You are playing paramecium in a primordial soup, eating each other's poop. And when you eat a paramecium, you poop out two poops of your color, and then other people eat that, and you slowly evolve your paramecium to have like tentacles or or flagellum so they can move more. And the tide changes in the primordial soup, which causes everyone to move around and actually is one of the best games I've ever played. But like weird concept like like and it, and it's done very abstract but yes it's it's the poop eating game as many people call it and so ryan ryan actually answered his own question it's ascending empires from 2011 oh, you know what i never had that one but charles frank Flick, another local game your way to galactic domination yeah charles frank owned a copy of that but he the boards is one of the fold-out boards so it's terrible for flicking and that's why i think the game didn't last so what he did is he actually made his own board well, it's or not a fold-out board. It's, it's, they're puzzles. They're actual or, puzzle, yeah, but this, puzzle pieces, but they, they have don't the fit edges. Flush. Yeah, right. they don't fit flush. I'm sorry. Again, I didn't own it. But I know he went and made, like, he went and got a four-by-four four piece of plywood and sanded it down, and, like, the planets are inset a bit, and you have to, like, flick and not let, hit the planet but land near it to show your ships there. I always wanted to try that game. It's, it's interesting because uh, the people are, like, in the, in the I'm looking at some of the photos, and they're like, no, it's not flat. That's part of the game. Again, it's it's one of those things well, where the texture is, is part it, of it. it, it wow. You wanted it fair. But <laughs> uh, so it's actually rated as 7.2 with 2,000 yeah. ratings. This it's is a solid game. Yep. No, I agree. That is supposed to be good. Yeah, planets were just set in the board. Yes. When he said a maze, I totally... <laughs> oh, puzzle board. See, puzzle board. I was thinking puzzle board like you're flicking around a puzzle. No, nope, but actual puzzle. Which piece now I it. want a game where you flick around the puzzle, like labyrinth <laughs> without the, you know, the wooden labyrinth, but instead right. you're flicking. That's what I was totally picturing in my head, which is something different. I swear there's other weird, like, I swear I could go downstairs and be like, wow, that's odd. Like, we have a game called Pooh, where you're playing monkeys flinging poop at each other. But I don't know, but it was too weird to be fun. It was just a dumb theme. And, the, and you had D20 health that you, we used to use D20. So you had 20 health and there was no way to track it. So we used D20s. Right. And it was fun in that way that Munchkin's fun. 
No, we, I think we got rid of Pooh. I don't know. We might still have it. <laughs> but I can't, I'm sure there's some. Yeah, I don't. Right. I, I can't think of anything really that counts to me as weird. Like, the, just... The, <laughs> the Tragedy Looper is probably the weirdest that I can think of. Although you've been recommending that, so I... <laughs> I, again, it's got a learning curve. If you yeah. can get past that learning curve, worth playing. There you go. I always, I always recommend that one with a caveat. It only ends up on a, a few specific lists. Like there aren't that many time travel games, or I don't own that many mystery games. Right. Yeah, dexterity games seem to get somewhat strange. Throw throw burritos weird. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you're throwing something at each. Well, and there's yeah, that hex hex. There's that one with the uh, the the cavemen clubs. Um, oh, architect. Architect. There, art tech's pretty weird. That, I agree, but it's definitely not too weird. Yeah. So art tech is a game where it's a cooperative game where you're telling your teammates how to build a structure. And you have a picture of it, and they don't. And it's a bunch of wooden blocks. The thing is, you can't speak English. And you have a whole list of mo moves, like whatever. I, Gunga means to the left, and, and Unda means stack it and whatever. And you get a big club, and anytime someone does something wrong, you bat them on the head to say they made the wrong move. And while they redid that as poetry for Neanderthals, I think. Uh, so yeah, that one's pretty strange. I, yeah, that fits is pretty strange. Um, Hex Hex is a, a hot potato with magic spells that gets ridiculous. Like once you have all the expansions and stuff in, and like it has elements where you have the um, was it spoons or whatever? You have stuff in the center of the table, and everyone has to grab one. And what it is is there's like three white things to grab and two black things, and someone gets stuck with none, and you never know which are actually good. You never know what you should grab. Like in general, whites are usually good, but there's some cards where they're bad. And you're trying to damage the other players by passing around a magic spell. And the basic game is kind of boring, but it's kind of like playing Flux, where like it starts off, you're just passing the thing and it gets stuck with someone that takes some damage. But then there's ways to like duplicate the spell. And sometimes you'll have 20 spells flying around the table. It can be fun. I ended up getting rid of it because it started actual fist fights at public play events. Because so, <laughs> people just took it too seriously. Um, uh, all right. Uh, this is a little quick one. I think we covered a lot of this, but what do you, what do your kids think of hero quest? Ryan's asking. Oh, my kids love it so far. We, we honestly haven't done much with it. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to sit down and get together too often. Um, the biggest indicator to me was they lost and, and fairly badly and, and still want to play. So always a good sign, especially Gwen is all about winning. Uh, her, her winning a game greatly influences her, <laughs> her like of a game, unfortunately. And, She's usually willing to give things a second try, but it, and now it's pretty much at the point where if she loses, she's willing to try again, but if she wins, she just likes the game. Right. Whereas the youngest doesn't care. The youngest goes in expecting to lose, so she doesn't get that upset by it. But yeah, they really enjoyed it. Um, I have a feeling they're going to want more character progression that's in the game, because they're very much about name their characters, draw the picture of their characters, and, and build your character, and there's really not a lot of that in Hero Quest. True. I still don't understand why they didn't make the first mission easier but <laughs> along with other issues with that game. yeah fair enough do they like the uh the 3d props um, i to be honest it didn't stick out for them because i use 3d props all the time true like, that's like, right it's not all that all that it's, it's not all that novel to them <laughs> because when we play games i tend to throw out 3d props like i have bowls full of 3d props for when i run D D or or i play gloomhaven or anything like that so, so it wasn't that weird. They do like the miniatures. I don't know. Uh, they were happy they could do an all-female party. So that's a thumbs up for the um, Mythic tier backing and getting the alternate heroes. They were mm -hmm. happy about that. They, they actually really like the fact they have an all-woman party. Excellent. They keep telling me I have to share more pictures online to upset people. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on. Uh, Jeff's got a question here. This one's funny because I have this on our list of questions. Oh. So, so he's asked this before. Are we going to argue? Are we gonna... Do so you... we can. Yeah. Do you own and keep games that you do not like just because they are important milestones in the history of board games and you might want to introduce someone to that historical contract context? I know I do, says Jeff. I, a very little amount, much less nowadays. I was more worried about it before. Um, especially like the, the big thing is when I run public play events. So if I run public play events, there are certain games that are great for introducing certain concepts. So Dominion is perfect for introducing someone to deck building. It is the best way to show someone the basics of deck building. Catan is still a really simple trading game that, and area control and teaches a lot of 
basic board game concepts that are used in almost every Euro game afterwards. Um, there's probably others. I'm drawing a blank. Dominion is the big one I know I still have. Though I, I really should get rid of Intrigue. Like, just keep Dominion. For some reason, I have both. And I don't really feel I need both. Um, but in general, no. Um, what I have to keep are games that were milestones in my progression, which is why my shelf behind me is covered in Games Workshop games that I probably will never play again. Like, I have dreams of sometime Sean will move down to Windsor and maybe we'll break <laughs> out some of these old games and see if they're still good. But in general, no, I I, I don't. Uh, most of the ones games I keep are, are nostalgia for me more so than, oh, this was a landmark. Or if it was a landmark, I still like it. Like, that's the other thing is, like, like I keep El Grande because it's, like, one of the most pure area majority games, but I want to play El Grande. Like, there's, there's no reason I wouldn't play it. They get the right group down and we'll sit down and play it. And, like, Shogun and Wallenstein, right? Like, I love that. Like, yeah, they're Cube Tower games and they they, they established a, a, almost a brand of games for a while, but I still like the games and I want to play them. So there aren't a lot that, um, like, we have a Scrabble board. I, I just kind of, it's old and we have it. I don't remember the last time we used it. I guess we keep that for nostalgia's sake. So I'd never brought it out to events. So not really. Like, like I have a couple. Uh, Dominion's the best one because I'm not a big fan. Like, I, I don't see when I would play Dominion on our own, except to show it to be like, I showed Sean. I'm like, here, you like deck builders. This is what started it. Now you've seen it. Okay, let's go play a better deck builder. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I Star Realms. Like what I do did do for a long time is I would keep games I don't like to bring to public play events. That's like, a, but even like I, that's why I have a copy of Love Letter. Love Letter is an example of one I don't really enjoy. And Hanabi, that's another one. Hanabi and Love Letter are two I own just to have at events. And those are ones that I specifically like to bring out to drinking events. Those are the ones I want to bring out to like Villains Bistro, Easy Mode, where people, they're, they're, they're social games more so than tactical games. And I do not love Love Letter. So that they, Love Letter is a good example. Dominion's another. But it's not like I have a ton. I don't have a bunch of, you know, gateway games just for introducing people to board games anymore. All righty. Excellent. I uh, hope that answers Jeff's question for him. Uh, next, we've got a question that came out of the Discord. Pax asks, what's a standout moment of delight at the way a new-to-you game played? Like something that made you laugh out loud because the game revealed itself to be so clever or elegant. Oh, this is an AMA where I don't have to think so much on my feet. <laughs> oh, oh, laugh out loud is hard. Um, probably medium. Medium would be an example. Yes, specifically medium. Sitting downstairs. I think you were there for yep. the first game, weren't yep. you? Sitting downstairs and I explained the rules and I passed the cards out. And specifically picking up my hand and seeing the cards and realizing how those cards would interact was awesome. Like, just like, oh, I get it now. Just seeing my first hand of cards, I'm like, oh, I get it. And then when we had the first, it went terribly, but the first actual trying to get a medium, which I think was Sean and D or it was Tori and D. I know D was involved. It was just it was anything. just me, you and D the first time. And it was, was okay, yeah. That was where so, that and that was where D just kind of just blanked. locked up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she just couldn't say a word. And we laughed and and like we hadn't laughed that much since probably telestration some night at 3 a.m. So yes, definitely. So that is 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 in a perfect example, I think, of that. Is is that game of median? medium it just clicked like like the two things the two moments of looking at the cards going oh wow they did a really good job at picking cards and then the actual ones like people laughing out loud like like falling off the chair laughing yeah. and like before that and it, it, the first time i played telestrations was like that going way back uh yeah. playing telestrations at 3 a.m at extra life events has definitely done it um i have another. to say for me now this isn't a laugh out loud but a sort of standout moment of of delight, I guess you could say, was the first time we sat down and played the Minecraft game. Yeah, build because we weren't expecting this to be a game. It, it was going to be. It, we were hoping it was going to be better than that trash uh, Minecraft card game I my kids got. <laughs> yes, but I was honestly not expecting the depth of gameplay in that. And when we sat down and realized, oh wait, this is. Wow, there's a there's a game here. Yeah, there's a um, real game here. It and and you know the way they use their cu the cube. You've got the 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 cube of cubes. 
the, the one thing that really makes it feel Minecraft. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're chipping away at this giant cube of cubes. Uh, it really shocked me because uh, I, I was completely not expecting them to have made a game game. So I wasn't as shocked by it, but yeah, it was definitely a, a surprising game. Well, and I think one of the things that holds you back a little bit from the, the, the delight is the combination of, uh, you know, the depth of research you do before you even look at a game, well, but yeah. also, but also the unboxing videos, uh, you're, I've you're already seen you're, you're, yeah, there's so much sort of ramp up to when you get that game at the table, it's pretty hard to hit that level. Yeah, it's true to be surprised. Uh, where's another one? Well, I mean, probably I, I would say probably Gokuku is would so would be something that. Oh uh, yeah, so so that's a perfect example, right? So here I am. I'm at I, at Origins Games Fair, and then there's Wayne Humphrey, the Star Wars guy, who's actually one of our patrons. So thanks, Wayne. Isn't he? Maybe not. Was well, uh, I think he still is. Is, is he, he still? I don't remember <laughs> saying his name. That's why I'm like, I don't think we have him on the list. I'm pretty sure he's still a patron. Wow, Wayne, sorry. <laughs> anyway, I know he doesn't tend to actually listen to podcasts. He's just an old friend from G+, who I've actually... He is the person I hang out with at Origins. He works uh, works the White Wizard Games booth every year. And every year, he has shown up with something that is like some dumb party game that ends up being awesome. Right. And the first year is one I still don't own. I can't bring myself to buy it. It was Cheeky Monkey. And he was walking around the Origin Games Hall the entire time with this stuffed monkey under his arm and you have to reach in the monkey's butt and pull out chips. And it's literally, it's a bag builder and the bag happens to be a monkey. So he definitely got me, got me into that one. Right. But I'm like, I don't know. I can't buy the monkey butt game. It was a little too late for me. <laughs> but then the next year it was, it was the mind. He was the first person I ever heard go nuts over the mind. Sorry, go bonkers over the mind. And well, everyone knows how much that exploded for a few years there. Now it's not quite the deal. It was, at the time, but at the time, he was the one that knew it. And he's like, you got to get to the Pandasaurus booth as soon as it opens. You got to get there. They're going to sell out. And I tried, and they sold out. But I did get to play it, and it blew me away on the mind. And I, I'll admit, I still don't actually own a copy of the mind, do I? No, we bought the mind. We do have the mind. I, I don't think I got it that weekend. Well, the last Origins we went to in 2019, he's like, Mo, you got to play this game. Go cuckoo. You got to go to the Haba booth, and you got to play this game. And it's like reverse pickup sticks. Oh, my God, it's amazing. And I'm like, the Haba booth? Like, Haba makes kids games. Like, but they make animal upon animal. Like, like they, they, they do some good ones. But I'm like, he's like, no, 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 go try it. So I had a meeting with T from Haba already set up. So when we get there, she's trying to show me these Euro games. So the, the, they had a new line of games which I think they called Game Night Games. I totally forget now. They weren't yellow boxes. Uh, King of the Dice was one. Like, they're, they're still simple games, but they're not kids' games. So she's trying to show me these, and I'm like, can I see Go Cuckoo? She's like, you want to see Go Cuckoo? I'm like, yeah, I want to see Go Cuckoo. She's like, you know, that was like a limited release for Easter, right? And I'm like, Easter's not even coming up. I'm like, yeah, but I heard this is really good. She's like, okay. And then she leads me over. They lead me over and show me Go Cuckoo. And, and I'm like, oh, that actually looks pretty neat. I, I want to take a copy, and I bought it. Like, I didn't even... This wasn't even a review copy uh, of Goku, so I so I grabbed Goku, and then I did make a deal with him to get some review things as well. But that's the part's not important. And then I take it, and we go. I don't remember where. We probably went back to home base because this is at this time I was hanging out with Miss Breck and Mark people, and we played it. I'm like, oh, this is brilliant. And <laughs> I don't know how many times we played over the weekend or how many people we played with, but that game got played at every social gathering I was at. We go to Barley's for drinks. I brought Go Cuckoo. We went to the Three Ponies for Shepherd's Pie. I brought Go Cuckoo. I went to an RPG. I brought it. And if the game ended early, I put Go Cuckoo on the table after playing Hydro Hackers and we played Go Cuckoo. So yeah, Go Cuckoo is a great one. Yeah, it's weird. Whatever they whatever they came out with, they don't seem to they seem to have killed that that branding already because I'm not seeing I think it was game night games. Like it, it's, it was on the box. I'd have to look at the, the box for King of the Dice. Um, Karuba was in that line, which yeah, you would they're not yellow, they're definitely not yellow. Yeah, they're but... non yellow, and I think they were called game night games, and it might have been inside the box. Uh, Terrible type game night sounds. approved because uh, there's have a family games, but those are a mix of yellow and other. Oh, uh, uh, nice. I know, terrible. I usually say I won't Google <laughs> while we're while we're doing this. I want the back of the box. Does anyone have a picture of the back of the box there? Does it say anything? Oh, it's not in English. Which makes sense because I think it was inside. Whatever. 
anyway, they launched a a new we're we're not just kids games brand, which made sense. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can't find what I think it was game. All right, I saw lots in the chat. I don't know if we saw anything important there. Not necessarily questions. Uh, but ta- a lot of people stuff. talking about uh, so a lot going back to those uh, you know classic games. Yeah. Talking about uh, Catan, Kark, Citadel, Puerto Rico. Um, okay, so Citadels I sold. Puerto Rico I still play. Kark's one. I, I like Kark though. Again, like like I, I'm not keeping it just because it's a good gateway game. But I'll admit it's been a long time since I played Kark, and I probably would only break it out with new people. Personally, I prefer Isle of Sky. But Deanna doesn't like Isle of Sky. Like, I think Isle of Sky kills Kark completely. Almost Jones theories it out of, for, for experienced gamers. See, where Kark's definitely, if, and, and why would I play Kark now with new gamers when I have Land versus Sea? See, and if like, I'm going to play Kark, I want to play the digital online, like the Steam version of Kark yeah. is really, really good. Like, mm-hmm. it's, I have, a, I have a hard time wanting to to bother with the, the setup of Kark when I know that there's a way better version yeah. sitting there on the computer. I used to play a lot of Kirk on the Xbox, and it was pretty good on the Xbox. Yeah, Kirk, Kirk, I think I still have two copies downstairs. One that's got all my expansions in, and one that's just the base game that I got off someone at some point because they didn't want it. So now Ryan doesn't join us on Sundays, and he's asking us about Kickstarters. Are we, are we going to cover any of that, or are we going to say I sorry, We can Ryan? talk a bit about Kickstarters because <laughs> we're not going to do a lobby, so we can do that. Sure. So here's the Might and Magic 3 reward game to crowdfund late this year. Any thoughts? And we do have thoughts. We actually went into detail on this on Sunday. But yeah, it's what they've done is they've taken the art from that feel and they've really sort of given you a lot of that inspiration. But we are pretty sure that they aren't going to capture the awesome combat system yes. of Heroes and Might and Magic 3 which is a huge drawback because like, like that's the whole point, right? You go around and you collect new troops and you upgrade and you do all that, like to win the battles to eventually take over the temple. I don't know that the company that's doing it does not have a track record. They don't have any, like they have designers who have designed things, but nothing, no, no big hits. Yeah. I, I am extremely skeptical of it. Like yeah. extremely. I think skeptical. it's going to look great. And I think it's going to give you feels looking at it. But I think it's going to suffer some as a game. <laughs> well, Jeff finds it odd. I call Carcass on Kark, but I, I don't. I've probably been doing that since like 2002 or so. Yeah, I've, I've, that's just what I've always called it. Probably because of you, maybe. I don't know. Probably. I'm, I've now called Catan Catan for years. That was always Settlers, 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 because that's what it says on my box. Right. They Before totally the branding. That part of it. And I'm like, I don't even understand why they decided everyone calls it Catan because everyone I know calls it Settlers. Some people called it Farm, Farm the Game, which oh, also yeah. I think fits. But yeah, absolutely. Or Casson. All right. I... It's called The Son. <laughs> play The Son, that tiling game. And no, honestly, I, I more so should probably get rid of it because Land vs. Sea is a way better gateway tiling game. Oh, absolutely. Nowadays. The one I love is Carcassonne The City, but no one even owns that one. I, I, is it The City? <laughs> The castle. I like both actually. Carcassonne, the city is the one that's designed by Rainier Nitzia and there's two player only. Right. That one's okay. I, I, it's good, but it takes up too much space. But the original, the other one, Carcassonne, the castle, I love where you actually have wooden walls you're building. And you put guards on the walls and they score based on what they can see. That is actually my favorite version of Carcassonne. Yeah, mm-hmm. the one in the wooden box is the, is the city. Carcassonne, the city. Um, we also own Heart Hunters and Gatherers, which is better than the original as well. So I prefer the original with the expansions I own, which is Inns and Cathedrals and Traders and Barbarians. I own more than that, but those are the two I always use. Right. So there, we've answered the question of what, how do you play Carcassonne? <laughs> uh, That's the one I wonder, I wonder, uh, you have all those online? Like the Steam, can you get Traders and Builders? I and- believe you can. I have not uh, done all the things that I almost never play it. So right. I haven't... Uh, um i haven't bought all the upgrades but i know there's a ton of different uh upgrades you can get for it so um they they don't uh they don't short you on dlc (laughs) of course not uh i'm jumping ahead a little bit here to one that pax had in the discord and uh so they've been binging video game speed runs recently and this actually is, is is a little bit uh i'm gonna reference the the chat room here as well their question is 
Are there any board games where you could see a way to use a quirk of the rules or mechanics, a glitch, if you will, to take a different path to the end game than the designers intended or anticipated? And I, and I jumped this one in, into the into the queue a little early because we've had people talking about Puerto Rico in the chat room. And as as frustrates many people, there are ways to play Puerto Rico that uh, have ideal solutions that I don't think well, the I don't think were ever actually in, anticipated or intended by the designer because they are game breaking. See, I'm not sure about that. It's it's not like that in, in, in Puerto Rico. The problem with Puerto Rico is there's a scripted opening. So it's more like there are set openings in chess and certain ones you play and certain you don't. Puerto Rico has a scripted start, which isn't a glitch. It's just there is a method that's better than other methods. And while if you don't, if you have anyone at the table who doesn't follow the script, it screws over the person on your left or right. I forget which. And while people get really upset because you stepped away from it, which personally, I think now you just made the game interesting because now we like if it really was that scripted start at turn six, like just do the thing like you get it, you get it, you get a. I I know corn's part of it. You get a corn, you get an ink, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. Now it's play if that's literally the problem. But the thing is, people can mess with it. But if you watch like a tournament, everyone's going to open the same. It's it's like it is the opener, which, again, I don't think it's really an exploit. It may have even been intended by the designer that there is a way that, you know, someone's got to grab corn. Someone should grab this. Someone should grab this. Someone should grab this. So that all these things are in play and these buildings are in play at the beginning. But again, that's bad design. Modern design would be give everyone that stuff to start. Then. So I, I don't see it as a glitch. Yeah, I, I it maybe bad does it game design i don't know i again you're right it should just jump to the sixth turn yes. with everyone having if all that stuff if that is actually the case to me that that does seem as uh unintended uh or or i don't know if it's unintended or just bad design one of the two yeah. i suppose um, i honestly don't know the difference and all you got to do is use the expansion and that's gone because right. that randomizes what buildings are in play and then you never have the script like it's it's been fixed by the designer by putting out the the buildings which now come with the base game so there you go all that's right well, definitely part of it going back to that question are there any board games where you could see a way to use a quirk of the rules or mechanics a glitch to take a different path to the end game i'm thinking there probably are but i'm not thinking of any now where i have had this happen is in escape room games mm -hmm. i have played escape room games where i got the solution and it wasn't the way they intended you to and I'm like, I got it right. And I'm like, but I did it right. And then I like look at the clues and I'm like, oh, that's how we were supposed to get there. Okay. Well, that's not how we did it or, or something like that. Um, and I can't think of a very specific example, but I know that's happened a couple of times, like not even just once. Um, or also in, in, in that type of game where we solved something ahead of time. And it was frustrating because there was no way to like input that, but we'd already figured it out. Um. I'm, I'm trying to think of like pitch cars. The one I think of where there's like, if you skip the track a certain way, like there's, right. there's rules for how many track sections. And if you played a lot of pitch car and you know that rule, you can look at certain layouts and be like, Oh, instead of going around the track, yeah, if jump. I do this, but then you're only allowed to skip certain sections. Yeah. Cause you can only skip three sections. I think it's it is, two right? or three or right. something. I, I don't remember the exact rule. Same with like, you're not supposed to like, if you bang into someone else's car and knock them off, they get put back. You can do some things to kind of bend the rules where you use someone else's card and you want to get reset. So you purposely do this, which is not in the spirit of the rules because it's supposed to be a race. Right. Well, and I think Jeff's asking, you know, how to use a glitch that isn't cheating. But I think the question is whether or not that glitch has been, you know, has been closed or not. Right. If there's an FAQ somewhere that, that answers the question, but I, you know, rule books have, you know, sometimes not fully, fully answered. They haven't, the the designers and and playtesters haven't fully found all the different games. I mean, look at Magic: The Gathering, right? You know, they, they need oh. to come up with a billion new rules every. There you uh, go. Magic is probably release. an example of of uh, lots of glitches people have found and exploited. Right. I, those they then they come out and eventually the game fixes them. But there are glitches that happen because you just can't account for all the possible combinations. And you've got some really smart people out there who can go, Oh, well, if I do this, 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 and this, all of a sudden you're instantly dead, you know, yeah. <laughs> and that sort of thing. Another one is, um, 
uh, uh, Warhammer 40k. There's a meme out there, and I couldn't tell you exactly how it worked, but there was some person who was winning all the tournaments but using some weird rule exploit about holding his entire army in reserve. Mm. And then someone else showed up and then did a thing where he started with his whatever on the opposite side of the board so the other guy could never deploy his troops, so he won. Yeah, and no, the, I, the I, actually, I like even remember that because like, you told me about that once and I, and I ended up researching it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah it was yeah, fascinating. Was, it was really interesting what he had done. Um, and it was, it was again, just... It, someone was abusing the rules and then someone better abused it, which yeah, yeah. I just, it was very much a schadenfreude moment <laughs> that I thought was really good. Absolutely. Um, war games definitely used to happen. Um, I know people cheat, but that's not necessarily a glitch. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, you need to look for those, those gaps like an in the exploit. rules. Yeah. It's, it's the gaps in the rules that haven't been covered uh and and the thing is with board games though is the rules are i forget the two words i'm, I'm gonna forget the rules words the, one of the big things that separates the board games from role-playing games is whatever the, the rules and board games are definitive or whatever right in a role-playing game or in a board game you can only do what the rules tell you, you can do whereas in a role-playing game it's what you can't do that the rules tell you and again i forget the terms for that yeah so even in board games like like the the exploits that some people are going to call exploits oh it's not the rules i can do this goes along with that well it doesn't say i can't punch you you know so uh, that's okay to do it and, and most board gamers won't accept that like the, the the table culture doesn't allow for people to pull in things that aren't in the book yep so it's 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 hard to get those type of video game glitches right like the, those short, shortcuts um some examples there's infinite points uh, Star Realms. Star Realms, there are quite a few combos that are hard to do it where you get you can get infinite points. And I pulled it off once, where it just has to do with thinning your deck so you keep cycling your deck because you're trashing a card to get points, and then you recycle your deck so you get to pick it back up and do it again type of thing. Dominion, there was a way to do that with a certain thing where you just never run out of actions, and there was a way to shuffle your deck. Uh, someone was mentioning uh, Chapel Plus Lab at Dominion. Yeah, see, maybe that's it. I don't remember. Um, but that, that's uh, what I said. I know there was a Dominion one. I wasn't actually reading the chat to know Dominion got pulled up. Deck builders. Deck builders tend to have, like I said, not exploits, but certain card combinations that are ridiculously powerful if you're able to get them. I, there was There's one in Clank where you can get infinite, like you can get all your cubes clanked out. Right. Uh, yeah, no, there's uh, there's definitely some stuff out there. I think... What, and a lot of it is uh, how rules are read uh, mm -hmm. and, and getting into the grammar arguments. I um, we yes. uh, I think it was uh, Draconis where we had there were a couple of things where it's like, OK, there is no FAQ. So we need to now analyze the grammar in the wording to see yes. what. The yeah, are there any other is. cards that say, yeah, you know, I, I can't remember what it was, but yeah, there was one in Draconis. Card game, anything where you're throwing in that many variables, right? Like card games. Every card impact impacts over there. Magic the Gathering, every CCG, every every one of those. Um, yeah. That's where you see it. But like, I can't think of like Shogun if there's some exploit about if you hold on to your cubes instead of putting them in the tower, you can do it or something. I, I guess the, the Risk Australia thing would be an example of turtling in Australia and Risk is probably an exploit where it's it's against the, the theme of the game, but it works. Yep. Yeah, and they're talking about people are talking about uh, rules and abilities and, and grammar in, uh, in in rules may versus must. Yes, um, and may it's interesting. Versus... I've actually gotten into this recently. One of the th one of the things I'm doing in my job right now is I'm writing a glossary of terms, and a lot of these terms that we come up with in in my job are from the construction industry. And right. one thing you learn in the construction industry is define, 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 define. So if you've got a spec and the word furnish is in the spec or provide, there will be definitions in there. Uh, even, even though there are standard definitions for those in the industry, they will be defined mm -hmm. in that document um, and, and things like that because the difference is, you know, massive whether or not you, you know whether or not you're you're including a fifty thousand dollar labor budget or just shipping some product <laughs> yeah the may versus must one's huge because i worked in quality for a number of years and with iso certifications may and must are huge and people don't understand the difference yeah you must have the following eight documented procedures your documented procedures may be kept 
you know, and yep. it totally mattered. Oh, absolutely. The, or sorry, the, 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 the more ISO one is, sorry, you must have eight procedures for these eight things. These may be documented. Right. Means they can be verbal, yep. which is something a lot of people forget, and they over-document. I'm like, why are you writing all this down? That's all stuff you can just get audited for and get in trouble for. Don't even write it down. As long as everyone can answer the question when you say, what is your process for this? You're good. That's right. how you pass ISO audits. <laughs> Make sure you don't write down anything you can actually get wrong. There we go. And if you want to hire me as a consultant for ISO auditing, I could use a, 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 a part-time job. So <laughs> tell you how to get through with zero nonconformances every time. So uh, D has brought up uh, privately that we're not going to talk about tonight, but I'll give you a preview of what's going to be coming up on Sunday. Okay. So uh, after our copyright and uh, legal episode that we did a little while back, uh, a large case has come is coming up in front of the Supreme Court that's mm -hmm. actually involving the game of life. Uh, and it has some interesting... Um, outcomes depending on on how the justices rule uh they have taken on the case so there will be a ruling it's just a matter of which way they go but uh it's got some interesting long uh it's, uh, interesting uh outcomes for content pre-1978 okay so we'll we'll be talking about that a little bit on sunday uh when we chat and deanna wanted to talk about um Playing games of vision impaired, which is a topic Ryan would probably be interested in. Absolutely. Although I know Sunday Ryan can't often make it on there on Sundays. So. On Sunday. All right. I think we should fire off Dave's questions and then put them back in the piles for the next time we have an AM. And then I think we'll wrap it up because it's almost 10 30. All right. I don't know if you have a, if, if the people in the chat, last chance, we're, we're going to go <laughs> hammer off these three quick questions and then. Um, which may not be that quick once I start thinking about them. Because again, I just kind of <laughs> looked at what they were. I, I vaguely looked at them and went, yeah, okay, what's game of the year? And I don't have an answer at this point. Um, <clears throat> and so if anyone has a question, get it in now, if you wish. Um, though I think you might want to throw this one in just because it is someone in the chat. Sure. See, it's it's basically there. I even copied Jeff's question there. <laughs> he just, I didn't even realize that's the one I copied from the apparently notes. We and, haven't. Uh... Yeah, I told you. I'm like, that's like the same question he asked. Yeah, oh, that's there funny. There See, it shows how much we read our show notes. I had copied Jeff's previous question in here as an if needed, if no one in the chat speaking up. And it was, he basically said, do you keep any board games because of their historical relevance? Yeah, Jeff really wanted to know. Yes, I guess he did. <laughs> All That's right, well, so Dave, I think we should cover this, but let's do Dave's. Yeah, Dave, Dave asked us in the Discord today. So with all these monthly AMAs, it might be fun to track some things. So first off, what game did you play the most of the past month? Past month, so we're talking January? Uh, I assume yeah, at I think, this point. Yeah, we're, we're still early enough in February. And, and honestly, I'm going to look this up. I am going to say off the top of my head, maybe Azul? Zool on Board Game Arena is going to be my guess. Possibly it's something like Aqualand, too, or something else D and I hammered off a bunch of games one night. <laughs> All right, let's look. Bod plays. Played 34 games in January. Wow, number one is Lost Ruins of Jesus. Killing all our lights. <laughs> Ruining the show. All right, Lost Ruins of Arnak. What are you doing? All right, apologies. This goes on YouTube. You're swearing. We gotta. We get you mad to ding that. I didn't even hear her. He spoke out loud. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, Lost Ruins of Arnak at four plays was my most played game of last month. Next was Aqualin, then the game, then Azul. So I was I was in the top five. And then Chronicles of Avel. All right. Well, there we go. Uh, I, I have to say mine is it's not, not going to be an Arnac. Um, I think Azul might be one, although we have to actually, I think I've actually finished more. We haven't of, finished as many we as we finished more we games finished. of Tapestry than we have of Azul. <laughs> no, I got two of each, actually. Oh, okay. Oh, I should. I, yeah, I said they're in order, but you know what? I have a whole bunch that are two. The Chronicles of Evil, Doodle Dungeon, Star Wars Unlocked, Tapestry, and WWE Superstar Showdown are actually all tied. 
so it looks like actually Sushi Go is my my uh, most from the last, which isn't a big shock. Uh, so uh, next up, what games are currently in the lead for Game of the Year? I mean, I know what D's going to say. So what you... uh, No, same thing. Arnak so yeah. far. Like uh, for us, it, it was new to me this year. Yep. Arnak definitely wins. Uh, being able to play it online has been awesome. Definitely enjoying Arnak. Uh, I don't think anything else has come close, to be honest. And I think that that answers our next question, too, which is the best new to you game you tried in the last month. Uh, yeah. All right, fair well, enough. Well, no, because, well, if it's new, when did I play Arnak first? Did I play it? Oh, yeah, because I got it for Christmas. Yeah. So, yes, just because it's January. I'm like, if, if we <laughs> go into this month, then maybe not. Yeah, so Arnak for both of us. So what I'm thinking is we can do this every time we have an AMA. We'll yep. try to remember to throw these in. So yeah, game of the year. Now, if I had to do a 2022 game, I don't think I played any. Yeah, and I think Chronicles I have of Avel. Say... There you go. Chronicles of Avel. Nope, that's 2021. And I have, mm. I have to say for me, Arnak is definitely in the lead for game of the year for me as well, uh, even though I haven't played it physically and I, I really need to. <laughs> yeah, it would probably help. Yeah, I have not. I'm looking to see if I've even played a 2022 game. I have not. Or it's, oh yeah, it should be going twenty twenty one, probably because like twenty twenty two, it's been a month. Yeah, there's almost no games haven't. that have come out yet in twenty twenty two. Yeah, there's almost no games that have come out. Those, so those will all start coming out in March, most likely. Yeah. So best game of twenty twenty one that I played is Arnak twenty twenty one. No, it's twenty twenty. Yep. So it's it's looking like Chronicles of Avell is the best twenty twenty one game I've played so far. Which might be the only 2021 <laughs> game I end up playing. I think Disney Sidekicks was in there. Yeah, but that's not that's nope. not winning anything. Nope, no, it's not. Uh, Dune Imperium. No, 2020 for Dune Imperium. It's older than I thought. Well, yeah, it's the same. Came out the same time as Arnak. So 2020 for both of them. Yeah, it makes sense. They were like the same week. That's right. Wow, Arnak's up to the number three in family games. Who the hell calls that a family game? That's weird. I, I yeah, I wouldn't call that a family. I game. wouldn't rate that as a family game. Strange. It's number 31 in strategy, but how is that a family game? Yeah, I don't know. The, the, that type family strategy. Can we edit that for people? <laughs> how do you vote on this? It's a poll, I guess. Fun for kids and adults. 74 people have voted it fun for kids and adults. Strange. Yeah, I don't thematic game none i put it thematic over family so it's not an emphasis on narrative all right well i have voted we'll see oh, right. <laughs> that, that changes things no that's not a family weight anything oh that was something we found out so uh because we're not doing a lobby because it seems silly to do a lobby after this is um my package from the op was returned to them oh that's so I probably should save that for, for the coffee break. I closed the notes somewhere, trying to find them, <laughs> see where we're at. So our last question you wanted to cover from Ryan yeah, yeah. is, what is Ryan. a game you have culled from your collection you never intended to, and why? All right, I think we talked about this, but Anachrony. So I back the Anachrony Fractures of Time Infinity Box which was a new printing of Anachrony in a bigger box with box inserts and a brand new expansion that didn't exist before that would fit all the existing expansions I already owned. And I backed it at some point and then later was like, oh, you know, we don't have a lot of money right now. And I just backed this $80 Kickstarter or something. I'm like, yeah, I am, we're selling games. And what happened was I listed some games for sale on Facebook and someone was like, what other games do you have? So I started just taking pictures and I was like, here's all of them. And I listed, showed them pictures, like 80 games. And they're like, they took eight of them and I sold them an acronym. So then months later, maybe even a year later, it was a long time. Whenever the Kickstarter delivered, it shows up on my porch and it was in here for a long time. And I'm like, it's in here, but I'm going to save it for an end of the episode unboxing. So it sat here for probably another couple of weeks. And then I open it up and it says upgrade pack. And I'm like, oh, shoot. And I went on Kickstarter and I looked and sure enough, I did not back at the get all the stuff level. Instead, I backed at the upgrade level and I no longer had the base game. So thankfully, I contacted the person that bought all these games off me and said, hey, I screwed up. And they went, oh, that's cool because we didn't like Anachrony, which I'm like, what? You didn't like Anachrony, <laughs> but whatever. And they sold the bat to me for the exact same price they bought it off me. So no loss, no harm, no foul. 
but man, I messed up. Like, like, <laughs> and then trying to get a copy of Anachrony at that point was going to be terrible. Oh yeah. Like it, it, it was, and as Deanna pointed out, when I first got it, I, I'm like, did they not ship me what I backed at? Because I swore I backed at the full level. Like I totally right. had convinced myself the whole game was coming. So that is, that is the one big example of when I sold something I shouldn't have. All right. And the follow up to that question is, what game do you keep trying to call from your collection, but just can't seem to find a new home for and won't just throw away? All right. So there's a few. Um, Big Trouble in Little China, the deck building game, legendary Big Trouble in Little China. No one seems to want it, even though I, I thought it was okay for a legendary game. I just don't like legendary games. Um, next would be Battleship Galaxies, which was awesome, but needed an expansion. It was a it, Hasbro worked with Avalon Hill to put out a new good version of Battleship set in space with like fleet battles and all this stuff. And it's really solid. But it comes with two armies that were meant to be expandable, and they were never expanded, and they never put out the other armies. And while well, it ends up being just the same battle over and over again, which is still more interesting than Battleship, but like I played that battle five, six, twelve times or something like that. So that one, no one seems to want it because I think they just see Battleship and are like, I'm not paying thirty dollars or more for Battleship. Um, and then there is a flicking game called Bicycle, but it's spelled weird because it's not in English. I don't remember exactly how it's spelled, and it's Pitch Car but with something called the Z-Ball. And it's a proprietary ball that has little ball bearings inside it. So unlike Pitch Car, where you're just flicking your crokinole disc, you can actually like put English and backspin on it. And it'll actually stop on a slope because of the small marbles or whatever inside it. And it's a bicycle racing game and it works like Pitch Car, but the thing is you have your bike and you put the bulb in front of your wheel, then you flick it and then you put your miniature back. And it uses ramps. It's like, it's like advanced Pitch Car, but it's just so hard. Like the Z ball takes actual skill to be able to flick. And unless you have a group that plays it all the time together and gets good at it, you bring it out to a public play event and people just like can't get it up the first ramp or get just keeps rolling back or flicking it halfway across the room. So I finally decided to get rid of it. And I paid a ridiculous amount of money for this one because it's not available in North America. And a whole bunch of people on board game geek at the time were like, Oh, it's so much better than pitch car and you can get so much better. And like you go on YouTube and watch people use the Z ball. It's really impressive. Um, and it's, it's a, there's another version called roadsters, which is even more so pitch car because it's race cars. So that it's down here. If anyone's interested in bicycle, um, it's all plastic and snap together, not wood. It looks like electric race car track. I don't know. And no one seems to want that. <laughs> Those are the ones I can think of. And then Deanna just pointed out one we shouldn't have gotten rid of, but we intentionally did. And that is Android, which we talked about when we were talking about mystery games. So that yeah. last episode, two episodes ago, yeah. when we talked about mystery games, Android, which is the Philip K. Dick board game, which is you are basically playing Blade Runner. And it, I, I don't know. I, I was so frustrated with a couple plays of it that I got rid of it. And the people I gamed with at the time hated it. But now I green with a totally different group of people. Like, I'm not even just counting Tori and Cat, but like my old Monday Night group is even a totally different group of people than my Android. Then the group I played with when we had Android. And I basically got rid of it because the people I played with hated it. And, I'm, and it is not a bring it out to public play event game. It's a three to six hour murder mystery, super complicated, lots going on game. And just isn't suitable for, hey, sit down, let's play this. Right. So it made sense. But yeah, I should have I should have kept that. I wish we had kept that. I want to play it again. And maybe I'd get it now and play it again. And somehow I got rose tinted glasses and I'm like, oh no. Uh Jeff, I think you're thinking of Android Netrunner, the card game, but I'm not positive. I don't think you can play Android. It's just called Android. I'm gonna look quick because although they're may they're very well well, maybe you can play almost anything on that uh yeah. system. Although I think uh they are still uh Dolph. Trying to search that doesn't work. Well yeah, you'll get all the hits for Netrunner. No, not even that. Just trying oh. to search Android gives well, you all yes. the Google. There you go. And <laughs> is it coming to Android? Can I get it on this? Yeah, no, that's not a good search. Yeah, one of those that's one of those game titles that just does not age well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. it's not listed under DLC games, but it's very well could be in the community. Yeah, I'm sure it's there somewhere, but all right. I'm going gonna... I'm gonna to give up soon. Yeah, Android Netrunner is on Steam, but yeah. not Android, which is, I'm, I'm assuming that's what Jeff was talking about. Oh, this is a completely different game. This is. And yes, Ryan's saying Android the board game seemed ambitious and crunchy in its time. 
Yeah. Yep. Uh, and Dana points out here, here's a good, weird, or unique game that was too weird for its own good. Because it just, they, like, for some of my friends, it was unplayable. It was a murder mystery where you don't figure out the mystery. You determine it during the game. Right. And yes, Jeff would probably love it. Um, it it's it's a, a mix of how Ketchum and Who Done It all in one. Because it's all about trying to, to find the murderer, but the murderer is determined by, like, player votes in the middle of the game. And there's literal jigsaw puzzles you have to put together. All of this would be apps nowadays. Like, you would literally, you play End Runner and you would go, oh, I have to do the code breaker. And they give you an app. Well, it's old enough game that they give you plastic, like, like not plastic, cardboard pieces that you had to connect. Right. And there was a circuit board in the corner of the board, and you got points by connecting points on it. And like I said, the neatest thing is everyone's cars were different. So you actually have, like, a, like protractors with a picture of your car and how far your car can fly every turn. And, like, one of the characters, their car is, like, super fast, so it's got, like, a long thing for moving around the board. And you literally have to use, like, a measuring tape thing to figure out if you can reach different spots. It, it might be great as an app. But like I said, the people I played it with hated it enough that were like, no, I, I <laughs> never want to see this on the table again. I'm like, all right. And like it was a regular who played all the time and then someone else didn't enjoy it. They didn't like the fact that their goal was to make someone the murderer and that person got killed. And they were like, it ruins the game because I can't win now. And I'm like, the thing they're missing is that it's a point salad. It's a point game. Just getting the murderer right isn't necessarily how you win the game. Part of it's keeping your character balanced because it's a noir and you have you have problems. All the characters have have issues they have to deal with during the game, and you have to keep your character balanced. You get points for that. And they like said connecting that circuit grid and whatever, talking to so many suspects, and that was all worth points. And you could very well not easily, but you could win the game without getting the murderer right. That was just an aspect of it, which is why we're like it's Philip K. Dick the board game. My, my favorite comment from the reviews on Android and someone else has actually commented, you know, who seconded it already is it's messy, inelegant and not well explained. But damn, if I don't love this game anyway. Yeah, no, no, it fits. <laughs> I, it fits. It's kind of like us, our love of follow the board game. Another like 25% like of the time, there's going to be a player who gets totally screwed over. As long as you're OK with that, the game could be really cool. Another one, this game feels like a Frankenstein's monster made from three games stitched together. It's big and bloated. I love the idea behind it, but it's a mess. A glorious, glorious mess. Yeah, <laughs> see, that's that's my memory. That's my rose-tinted glasses. I, maybe if I got it again, I'd be like, why do I get this back? Let's sell it. Yeah. I I mean, it's, a it's, it's, it's a four. It's a it's it's a it's a oh, yeah. four. It's not a yeah. <laughs> 180-minute four game. Yeah, then think of it, think of a thematic a mirror trash game with a weed of four basically right <laughs> like what is going on yep all righty all right now we'll wrap up i will read my last bit we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions if you got a question for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com thank you everyone for your questions tonight and for joining us here live Welcome to our review of the King Size Majestic Wolf Puzzle from Unidragon, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this puzzle. So this wooden puzzle comes from Unidragon, the same company that created Quezzle, Amazing Cappadocia, that we reviewed last episode. This specific puzzle, our family, sorry, the specific puzzle our family built was the King Size or Hard Difficulty Level, which has 310 pieces and an MSRP of $99.95 US. This puzzle and others like it from Unidragon are available in four different sizes, with King being the third step. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, one thing to note in regards to that price, Unidragon often has sales. Like, honestly, I'm very close to saying they always have at least some kind of sale going on. For example, right now, at the time of this recording, you can get 30% off this specific puzzle and even more off for the smaller sizes. Plus, if you use our exclusive code bellhop, one word, you get another 10% off. As well, their animal collection from which this puzzle comes has about 20 different animals to choose from in the various sizes and difficulties. So the Majestic Wolf puzzle features an abstract wolf head with obvious native inspirations. Very colorful, bright, and interesting just to look at. One of the things that makes this puzzle interesting, though, and more difficult than most puzzles, is that it doesn't feature a frame. So you can't go hunting for edges to start this puzzle off. 
Another cool aspect of this puzzle is the fact it contains a number of thematically shaped pieces, including various wolves, the animals they hunt, as well as other surprises, which I'll leave you to find on your own. Well, for a look at how this puzzle is packaged and some of the pieces, including some of the uniquely shaped ones, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, the king size version of this puzzle, which is the one we have, is 310 pieces. Other sizes include simple at 99 pieces, medium at 185, and royal at 700. Now, in addition to the piece count increasing, the physical size of the puzzle also grows at each size. The smallest starts at 6 by 7 by 9.5 inches, going up to 16 by 0.5 by 22.5. Now, the piece quality is fantastic with everything fitting together perfectly. The artwork is nice and bright, and we didn't notice any scratching or damage on any of the pieces. And normally, the next thing we would do is talk about how to play whatever game we are talking about. But we can't do that here. Unlike Quezzle, there is no game element to this Unidragon puzzle. You just build it, and you're done. Now, that said, I do want to make sure people do realize there's more to this than your average puzzle, which comes in the form of the uniquely shaped pieces this puzzle is made of. In addition to some really unique shaped pieces, quite different from most mass market puzzles, you can also find wolves, a moose, squirrels, birds, and even a hunting lodge with the trees surrounding it. We talked about this in our previous review for Quizzle, but similarly, this puzzle is not your standard fare when it comes to shapes, even beyond the few special thematic shapes. Right. Now, no game here, but was it fun? So first off, I have to point out, I personally didn't build this puzzle. It was Deanna who actually requested we review this one after having such a good time building Quizzle with Gwen. It was the two of them that built the Majestic Wolf together. I just watched for a bit, asked them what they thought, and took some pictures. Now, puzzles are definitely a taste that not all people share, really a hobby unto themselves. So as for our thoughts on this particular puzzle, let's start with the component quality. Everything about the puzzle was excellent. Nice, thick wooden pieces, bright artwork, everything fit together well, some added etching on the back of the tiles to see what the special ones look for. Our only complaint here is the same one I have with Quezzle, and that's the fact the box doesn't seal shut in any way. And really, I do think this is a difference between gamers and puzzlers. I'm willing to bet if you ask them, they'd be confused <laughs> why you wanted to stand it up. Yeah, I know most board gamers throw them out, but like this is like a high quality wooden box with art on it. It seems like it's its own collector piece that you'd want to display, especially showing off that front art, which you can actually see over my shoulder there. As for building the puzzle, it was fun. My family really enjoyed the difficulty of not being able to start with an edge or a corner. Uh, they ended up basically starting at the middle of the puzzle and working out with the eyes and the nose being built first. I remember at one point, my daughter was pointing out and, and somewhat complaining, there are so many curves. Now this puzzle took them a couple days to finish with the whole thing taking over two hours. Now at the end, Deanna noted she wished she had taken more time with it. He felt they kind of rushed it in order to get our game table back for game night. And I think everyone would have enjoyed it more if he just left the puzzle set up and worked on it for a bit of time each day until done, instead of kind of rushing to get it done. So heads up for anyone who does consider picking up this puzzle or anything else from Unity Dragon, take your time and enjoy it. Find a spot where you can leave it set up to play with it over multiple days. And that's often the case with puzzles. Much like with coloring books, it's not the end, it's the process that is the real reward. I totally agree. Now, Dee and Gwen both thought the real highlight of this Majestic Wolf puzzle were the hidden pieces. What really stood out, especially when compared to Quezzle, is that these unique pieces were actually themed to go along with the puzzle itself. While building the puzzle, you're gonna discover an entire wolf pack and the animals they hunt, as well as a hunting lodge and the woods around it. To me, this is the big thing that sets these Unidragon parts puzzles apart and above most other jigsaw puzzles. So indeed, especially at this price point, it's really something I would expect to be more high-end, hand-cut designer puzzles. But while upper end, Unidragon is still pretty mass market. Now, one thing I was thinking about with these hidden pieces that to me is a big missed opportunity, and I'm probably only thinking this is because we played Quezzle first, is I don't see why they don't include 
puzzle-like quests in these puzzles, in all their puzzles. They just give me a sheet of paper that has me trying to find those hidden pieces. Like, find the hunting lodge. How Find the trees. Can you find all eight of the wolves or whatever? I'm making up numbers here. I don't know how I don't remember how many wolves are actually. As it is, there isn't even a list to check off to make sure you spotted them all. And because of the fact the shapes are blended in with the colors, like the squirrel doesn't look like a squirrel on the colored side, it's really easy to miss one of them unless you happen to see it on the back or it really sticks out as a distinctive piece. And like, honestly, like just throw a checklist in. Even having a checklist would be a cool addition. Did you find all the things? I think, honestly, Unidragon, if you're listening, this is something that will improve all of your puzzles. Though so I think the completionist aspect of puzzles is really finishing it. The cool pieces are just a bonus along the way, I would guess. Uh, oh, yeah. especially, since, especially since if you wanted to fix it for mounting, you couldn't exactly have the special pieces left out or anything. You just would have seen them along the way. Uh, fair enough, though I still think you could probably mount it with how tight the wood is. I think you could probably mount it and still make those specific pieces able to pull out and pull not. They're, they're spread out enough that you're not like removing a, a main structure of the puzzle by pulling them out. I don't know, just maybe it's because I'm more of a gamer than I am a, a, a puzzle builder myself. So maybe that's why I want the game aspect. And to me, it's just like throw it in there in case anyone wanted it. Overall, though, my family really enjoyed building the molestic, majestic wolf puzzle from Unidragon. It was challenging enough to keep them interested features fantastic artwork, well-cut pieces, and has the added bonus of being frameless and having lots of cool, unique shapes to discover while building the puzzle. The edge thing is a big deal, but also notable is that this puzzle is very mandala-like in its coloring, so mm -hmm. you don't even get big patches of color to reference, or uh, as, as well as not having those edges and, and shapes. No, nope, I agree. If you're a puzzle fan, you really should take the time to check out Unidragon and their puzzles. While there, be sure to use code BELLHOP, all one word, to save you an additional 10% off. If you aren't a puzzle fan, you probably aren't listening to this review at this point, but if you're still here, there really isn't anything here that improves the basic puzzle formula enough that I think it'll be of interest. Now, if you are puzzle curious, a Unidragon puzzle may be a cool place to start. These wooden puzzles are definitely a big step above the cardboard mass market puzzles I grew up on and have totally won me and my family over with their quality and cleverness. Well, that's it for our review of a king-size version of the Majestic Wolf Puzzle from Unidragon. If we've tempted you at all with this review, remember to use the code BELLHOP, all one word, over at unidragon.com to get 10% off your order. I also invite you to check out the written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. And right, not one, not two, but three games came off the Pile of Shame this week, as well as some other gameplays. Starting with the Pile of Shame games, I've got WWE Superstar Showdown. This is an officially licensed WWE board game from Gale Force 9 that was published back in 2015. Now, I actually picked this one up on sale after getting back from Origins with a copy of Worldwide Wrestling and the International Incident Expansion from Nathan D. Paoletta. This is a Powered by the Apocalypse role-playing game all about wrestling inside the ring and out. The players I had at the time liked using minis, and I thought being able to represent abstractly at least who's in the ring, who's out of the ring, and where everyone is would be very useful for the role-playing game. Years ago, I bought this. What I had never actually done is sat down and played the game. I never actually tried the board game that came, up, that came with this. And I, while talking about this game online, and I think the, the main time it came up is when I shared a deal with it at Tabletop Deals on Twitter, Tabletop underscore deals that I started getting all kinds of people saying, wow, this game's way better than it deserves to be. This is a, a great game. You have to check out there. You have to try this. This is the best role-playing game, or sorry, role-playing, best wrestling board game out there. This is fantastic. You've got to try it. So I finally sat down the other day uh, that it was on a Friday or Saturday night, and Deanna and I played two rounds of it um, because it was good enough to play twice in a row. The hype is right. Well, it's amazing how many people come out of the woodwork when you mention this game all raving about it. Yeah, it's true. Like everyone. And, and they're right. This is a very solid game. Like 
to kind of give you an overview. As expected with wrestling, it's basically rock, paper, scissors. Because that's what you have to do when you make a wrestling game. It's all about countering your opponents and doing the right move. I know it's rock, paper, scissors, bomb or something. I don't know what you call it when you have the thing that beats all of them. It's whatever that is. I'm sure there's a name for it. Um, this is, is is much more than that, though. It's not just rock, paper, scissors. Every wrestler has their own unique deck of cards. And the distribution of the three main moves and the power move are different, depending on which wrestler you're playing. In addition to that, the individual cards are actually different as well. So it's not just a matter of you played a grapple when you played a maneuver. It, there's more to it. And the way it works is it's actually a programmed movement, miniature skirmish game, and a really good one at that. Like, I honestly wouldn't mind seeing this engine used for something other than wrestling because I think it would work. I think you could do a gladiatorial battle or even Space Marine fighting off a, against an Eldar or do the enemy mind thing or Kirk versus the Gorn. I think any of those would work where you have one person against another, like small group skirmish. So each round, you're going to program three moves from your hand. You then reveal the first move. Here's where the rock, paper, scissor thing happens. I compare my move to your move. Whoever wins gets to do what's on their card. The other person's card goes in their discard. The things on the card are all kinds of different things like moving, building up momentum, setting up later moves, tossing your opponent, and of course, hitting them with the move. After all three cards are revealed, you do that. You reveal the one, you do it. Then you reveal the next, you do it. Whoever won, the rock, paper, scissors gets to do their move. In a tie, you play war, which I thought was a little weird, but you know what? It really added to the unpredictability of wrestling and felt like a fit thematically is literally if you tie, you just draw a card off the top of your deck and that's what you're doing instead. But it fit that whole, the move you went to do didn't work, what do you do now thing that you see in wrestling. So I even thought that was good. After all three cards are revealed, you then look and see who won out of all of them. So whoever has the most face-up cards then gets a chance to pin their opponent. They have to be next to each other, otherwise a pin doesn't work, which makes sense. And you have to be in the ring, can't do it outside the ring. And yes, there are full rules for going in and out of the ring and jumping off turnbuckles and bouncing off the, the ropes. That's all part of this. So what they have to do is they have three. They have a three count to kick out. If you have a kickout card in your hand, you play it. Otherwise, you draw a card. One, if it's not a kickout. Two, not a kickout. Three, if it's not a kickout, you're out. In addition to that, damage cards. When you damage your opponent, you give them cards out of your deck or your hand. If you run out of cards, you're KO'd. You win a match by either pinning your opponent or knocking him out. Now, the game also includes various match types, including up to three-man tag teams, six players, which is all the game comes with the six wrestlers, a gauntlet where you have to fight through lots of people, as well as like your Rumble-style last-man-standing type of match. In addition, you can also play an event, which is three matches of different types, and with those, your character basically gets XP, and it's based on the cards that you collected during the match from your opponent. So the quicker you defeat them, the less XP you get. So there's actually a reason to draw out the match. The more cards you collect, the more you can do it. And then you can use those to get points, or you can actually trade them in for new moves. So there's even like a little mini level up system, almost like a mini campaign, but at most three matches. There's even a deck of stipulation cards that you can randomly select to add special rules to a match. And interesting, like two of the cards say no stipulation. So you can just shuffle it and go, what's the stipulation in this match? All of it, this, this has everything i'd want in a wrestling board game like, like like i can't think of anything that's missing here except a stable of wrestlers like I, who cares about these six wrestlers like i don't know what period of the wwe but i have no idea who daniel bryan is uh roman reigns i've heard of john cena of course was famous enough i know who he is big show that goes back in the day totally cool for that randy orton which i remember being cowboy bob orton part of a tag team at one time I think that's the same Randy Orton. Maybe it's his son, because that shows how much I know. Big E, never heard of him. And, well, that's it. Those, those are the six you get, which just, to me, aren't big-name wrestlers. I'm sure they were at the time, but that doesn't impact me at all. And sadly, this game is very, very, very dead. To the fact that Gale Force 9 doesn't even list it as their website, and you can't even find a record it exists by them, which I have to assume means they lost the license, and they had to pull down all the wrestling stuff. This is a great game. Like, everyone's right. But it's dead. And it could have been so much better. Like, it was already great. And it could have been more if it just had expansions. I want to be able to flip the ring over and play an ECW-style cage match or something. I want a bigger stable to grow from. I want new moves that my characters can learn. I want 
some kind of weird back room roll on the table and see what happened outside the ring. Like it could have been so much better. Yeah. Everyone I see mentioning it, this says the same thing. Expansions. I think a solid game came out at the wrong time in the history of wrestling and suffered because it's included in large part because of its included performers. Yeah. It's not that they're bad. It's just that they do not have that draw of mm. some of the prior or newer fighters. Uh, you know, I mean, again, John Cena and Big Show are the names on that box and the rest of them. I've either never heard of or I have heard of, but only in a sort of distant manner. And I have followed wrestling off and on mm -hmm. throughout the years. And it's just, why would I want a bug game with those wrestlers? No, I totally agree. Like, I would love a rock and wrestle, but like a, a classic Hogan, Piper, Junkyard Dog, Macho Man. I would absolutely adore that. I would also be really happy with an attitude error with a Triple H, Steve Austin, Undertaker, Kane, yeah. that stable or modern. I don't know. I would I, I, wrestling. I was a huge fan during the attitude era. I was big into it. I was just as into WCW as WWE or WWF at the time and ECW when they came in. And I want a luchador expansion. Give me a luchador expansion with some some more moves off the ropes like, oh, it could have been so good. Yep. And not that it's bad. And I honestly, I'll straight up say, I recommend picking this up if you're a wrestling fan. And one of the things that's awesome, fan support. There are decks out there. There are STL files for Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper. And I am, I, I'm tempted. I, I am very <laughs> tempted. If, if I, if I had more wrestling fans locally that I knew would play this regularly, like D and I had a pretty good time. But it's one of those, if D and I are going to sit down and play a game, are we going to play this or something else, right? But if I had some, like, like D is a big wrestling fan too, so she is a real wrestling fan. I'm not trying to say it in a bad way, but just if D and I are going to sit down, we're either going to play, like, an, a great two-player game, like a Duke or, or Patchwork, or we're going to go for something heavier like Arnak or whatever. I, I just can't see it humming up that often with us. Now, what I do really want to try with this is multiplayer, because there are rules for playing up to six players. And I, I'd love to see those in play. And Dan is noting in the chat, shockingly asymmetric decks. And I agree. And it's not like, for one, it's the distribution of the, I'm, I tried to find a card of these. I should have just grabbed my copy, but at the time it was still in the basement. Um, uh, the, it's like slam move and maneuver or something and slam beats them all. But like every wrestler in the box has a different distribution of them, which I thought was really cool. Like, like what I, I've, John Cena, all about jumping off the corner, which I'm sure is a thing for John Cena. Um, Raymond Reigns is all about power and no momentum. Big Show, all about momentum. Get him moving. Bounce off the ropes, get him moving, and then have him hit people. Does a, does a ton of damage, right? And it fits the wrestling styles of these characters. It's just so well done. Like, I, I can't say enough good things about this game. But it's no, like, great Euro. It's no next Lost Ruins or Arnak. But for a wrestling game, it did everything I wanted. There you go. Next up, Dune Imperium, the kind of the exact opposite in a way of WWE. So this is a Dune game based on the newest movie as well as the books uh, set right at the start of the series. And this is all about fighting over Arrakis. You're going to take on the role of a leader of one of the four great houses of the Landsraad and try to exploit Arrakis. Which is an odd choice because there weren't ever four houses involved in Arrakis. Uh, the game actually uses two houses that are primarily from the books of Brian and not in any way developed or flushed out by Frank er er Ebert's writings. I, I couldn't remember. Yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly couldn't remember. I'm like, I remember those houses, but I read all the Doom books, like including yeah. all the stuff from his son. So I couldn't remember what was in the, I, 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 what was, was canon and not. I know it's all canon, but. Yeah, it's, a, it's technically all canon, although personally, I am a Frank Ebert, Ebert fan, uh, and I have just chosen to ignore the other two authors, Brian, and I forget who the, the, the third Kevin author J. is. Kevin J. Anderson. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah. I, so I have read all of those two, so <laughs> I am definitely a fan. And and the, the new faction that's being added with the expansion is, of course, Ix, and that's the one I'm most interested in that. Which is actually well, which is actually interesting because one of the factions that is there is actually a competitor of Ix. 
Um, oh, that's interesting. See, <laughs> see, I think X is a faction not that you play. I think okay. it's a new fact, which I haven't gotten. To, I'll get to that in a second, how that works. <laughs> but I think X is a new part of the board. Right. A not, faction, not a house. Yes. Yes, that's exactly. It's a faction, not a house. So anyway, this game is, a, is, as I'm sure you've heard from a million people already, a combination of worker placement and deck building. One thing no one seems to talk about is it's also an area majority game. The area majority aspect in this is big, and I don't hear anyone talking about that. Um, one thing I will say, this is done very different from Lost Ruins of Arnak since everyone seems to want to compare these two games. Uh, this is much more, compared to Arnak, a much more of a traditional deck builder, where you've got the same starter deck. Each round, you're going to play all your cards, ending with buying more cards for your deck, which go to your discard, and you're going to be drawing cards every round and so cycling through your deck with the whole once your discard's empty, you immediately, once you have to draw and your discard's empty, you reshuffle. So it's definitely more of the feel of a traditional deck builder, where Arnak is is... is the term deck building is almost questionable in that one. It's almost deck construction in a different way because you don't cycle your deck over and over and over through the game. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, sorry, I was just uh, distracted. Uh, but all of this is actually from the people who developed Clank. So you know right. that you know, understand a little something about deck builders. Well, not only that, it's also the company that did Star Realms. Star Realms Digital. So Star Realms and Ascension. So they, they <laughs> definitely have had their hands in lots of different uh deck building games so this has the whole thing where cards have two uses you can play them during your turn to take actions on the board and sometimes get a benefit for playing at the same time this is the worker placement aspect or you can save them for what's called the reveal phase so basically you're going to take a number of actions i uh, usually up to three maybe four if you've got a mentat and then at the mm -hmm. end you're just going to reveal all your cards and then you get the different part of the card that's going to give you various things. It's going to give you influence to buy new cards, as well as giving you combat strength for the battle, the area control thing that's going on, as well as some cards give you like victory points and money and other things. The main thing you tend to get, though, is influence to buy new cards or combat strength. Now, some interesting bits here, because I'm not doing a full review, is that many of the worker placement spots are tied to the factions. Now we're talking about the Emperor, the Fremen, the Bene Gesserit, and I forget what the last one is on the board. Uh, Space and Guild is, are the main factions. And then at the top, you have the Lancerat and Chom. And you're going to those different spots. Well, when you go to the main four factions, every time you use one of the worker spacement spots, you get influence with these, which is a big part of the game because those are tracks you're going up. And that's you got even, four basin tracks. And that's even canonically quite important yes. because the factions are the true strength behind the Empire uh, yes. as important as the Lancerat itself. Yeah, you're, you are doing a lot of political plays. And of course, one of them is Fremen. So you are definitely dealing with the people on Arrakis, but this is where you tie in the rest of the world. Now, the game is actually a race, which was surprising to me. I wasn't expecting that at all. It's actually a race to 10 points, with a lot of these points coming from influence from those factions. I honestly doubt you could win a game without working, like working the factions in some aspect. Uh, you can also gain victory points by winning battles on Arrakis, uh, collecting high cost victory point cards. There's a, there's a landworm card that is very similar to the provinces in Dominion. It clogs your deck. It does nothing when you buy it. It costs nine influence. It's really hard to get nine influence. You get a point when you get it, and then it generates one spice if it happens to come up in your deck and can't be used to play anywhere on the board. So it's it's not a good card. I said very similar to provinces in Dominion. Um, we've only played once. There's obviously more going on. Seemed really solid. The problem was we played two players, which uses an Atoma system, uh, which is a deck of cards representing another house, which I should have gave you the name of that house because you could have looked up to see what the heck they were. And it begins with an H or something. I want to call it House Hester, but I know that's not it. Something like that. And it represents a third player. And you're going to flip a card over. It's going to do a thing. They're going to take up a spot on the board. They're going to gain influence if they happen to be on one of the spots. And they're going to clog up their worker placement spots. They're going to put troops into the battle, but they don't collect anything. They just get in the way. Yeah, no, and that makes sense because you need, with the worker placement aspect, you need something more than just two people to, yes. to actually make that work. Yeah, I, it, it makes sense. Uh, the other pro thing that I've seen games do is you remove spots, right? So the alternative would be to have a two-player side of the board with less spots on it. Right. I don't know what I prefer. I think I might have preferred that because I didn't really enjoy it. Uh, the, the spots the AI took were just purely random, and they made no sense. Like, like 
they're not taking part in the battle, but they're collecting troops. Or they're going up here to collect a ton of water, but they're not using any spots in Like it just, it was just random. Like, and, and literally, I think the deck is, you know, three copies of every location and a shuffle the deck card type of thing. Um, they often took spots. There's no possible way they could afford early in the game, which made them very difficult to get some very important spots. I don't know. I just, I personally did not enjoy it. Um, it was fiddly. Um, the cards themselves are just icons. So we found it kind of not clear on what to do all the time. Now they did put out an app, Direwolf Digital. They make a lot of apps for, for uh, deck building games. I put on this app and the app is fantastic for telling you what to do. They literally give you a checklist for you to check off going, place a worker here, take two of these things, do this thing, and then, you know, move them up this track, whatever, you're done. The problem was the app kept crashing. Well, not crashing, but if your phone timed out, it booted you out. And I had to then reopen the app and I had to restart the game and I had to select two players and then I had to hit continue. And like that happened every 15 minutes or so if we didn't constantly tap my phone. And then other times it just crashed, like like I'm hitting draw and nothing's happening. So then I had to close the app and reopen it. Now, I will say it was impressive that it always remembered where we were. So that was well done, but I almost like now that I've played it enough, I might just switch to the deck of cards. Though it did help me figuring out what those icons meant for the first play. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I just wasn't a fan of the two player. Like, yeah, it's really hard to get Atama set systems to work well. Um, you know, as soon as you need to start moving bits and flipping cards, which again, because you're you're not taking away spaces, you need to have that. Uh, you know, using that space on the board, um, it's it's hard not to uh, it's it's hard not to be fiddly. Yeah, uh, and also oh, the. Uh, Hagal is the name of the the deck, and they, uh, they're known as off. the Jewel Planet. It's not even really a, a a house. It's a it's one of the planets. That's actually where Sue Stones come from. Okay. Well, they definitely play like a faction yeah. somehow. I don't know. So that that seems non canonical. Maybe in movie number two, we'll have House Hagal show up and do something. I don't. Know. Well, interestingly, so. The the X expansion really kind of moves things forward in time, like way forward in time. Oh, okay. Uh, into you got the greening of Arrakis going on. No, no, well, not not quite that not far. Not that far. Not okay. that far. Uh, but uh, and it actually adds three new households as okay, well as cool. the X. Um, as a, yeah, so the X is a new faction. That you're the X is a new faction, and, and yeah, apparently, sure apparently, what it is is. Uh, from them, you're buying technology. Obviously, makes sense. Makes sense. So you're getting you're getting technological upgrades to your to your household. No, it, it was it was interesting enough that I am looking forward to playing with more people. Yep. I don't think I'll ever try it again. Two players, like like maybe if we go a month before playing it because of the pandemic, we're not able to get together, and we might try it two player to refresh my memory. But I I just I, it's one of those I shouldn't have two player in the box. So I know other people who enjoyed it. At two, well, and so. you can play it at solo even. So uh, solo looks completely different. It does use that. Uh, I, again, I forget the name. Hagel, 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 Hagel. It does use that deck as well, but there's something else going on. Yeah, there is solo play, which I it, I think that's more because the game came out during the pandemic and companies have started throwing solo play into everything. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't tried it solo. Maybe I will. Maybe so, I won't. So right now, three player is leading uh best it's it's best at three four with three player leading the uh three okay leading the uh vote uh but it's it's still pretty i don't know it's it's three is pretty well far, firmly in the lead there okay. uh one and one and uh, two is there but i don't know well if is one beating two uh one is uh no one isn't no, no. okay Four is so, beating, so four is if Board Game Geek thinks one's not as good as two, and I didn't enjoy two, I don't think I'm going to rush to play this. Well, this the, is not the vote, Pile of the vote count is still questionable. So, yeah. no, this is not Pile of Obligation. This is a game I own, and I feel no need to play it at one player. So, <laughs> unless someone, uh, one of our patrons, asked me to review it at one player, then maybe I'll do that. Right. All right, moving on. Final game I got off the pile of shame is Scorpius Freighter. This is from Alderic Entertainment Group, one of their sci-fi games. Now, there was a lot of buzz about this game quite a while ago, because this is not a new one. Um, when it came out, and everyone's like, it's Han Solo the board game. And I can see it a bit, but only if all Solo ever did was pick up and deliver stuff and upgrade his ship. And it's a crew of four, not two. Like, there's probably Wookiees. But, like, there's no fighting Imperials here. And 
Uh, like, yes, there's the theme that's all about you're trying to smuggle stuff and there's patrol ships that go around the board, but really they're just the rondelle you move around. And technically, if you go around the rondelle all the way, they confiscate a piece of your cube, but really that's just the timing me mechanism. There's nothing that really made me feel like we were playing smugglers. That said, it is a cool game. Uh, it, it's a near gateway, rather quick pick up and deliver game that features three rondelles. Each turn, you're going to dedicate some of your four member crew to flying the ship. You then pick one of the rondelles and you're going to move, move the, again, the Imperials or whatever, that many spaces on the action wheel and then take the, the action of the space you land on. The number of crew you didn't assign is who's left to do the task, which I actually thought was a, a really brilliant mechanic. If you have more crew left, you're going to get more benefit from the spot you stop on. So if you're only moving one, you'll have, you might have three crew, but you also then have to use the same crew next turn. So if you dedicate two one turn, the next turn you're going to only have one to dedicate. There's a neat thing with your four crew there that I thought was pretty cool. So it's a pick up and deliver with rondelles. Yep, pretty much. Now the actions include adding new modules to your ship, upgrading your crew, you flip them over, they give special abilities, picking up cargo, getting and completing contracts, completing side jobs, and while using those modules you've added to your ship. Uh, victory points mainly come from completing contracts and side jobs, as well as end game scoring based on members of your crew. Now, we only played once, we use standard crew, and I have been told by many people, uh, interestingly, including the designer themselves, that the only real way to play this game is to draft your crew, which I think makes sense, because the one thing we did notice is that your initial crew selection, based on the set crews that come in the game, like you just pick all, I pick the yellow crew, or you pick the red crew, um, very, they were very scripted. They basically told you exactly what you should be doing. You want to only do these kind of contracts, and you only want to carry this type of cargo. And that was really my main complaint with the game, especially because I played a faction where the cargo holds to hold the cargo I would get the most points for didn't come up until halfway through the game. So that felt a little odd. But again, even if the designer is like, you know, you, you can tell the designer was like, I didn't want to put this other mode. I wanted drafting to be the default. And some developer said we better put an easy mode in. It sounds like you really do need to play this with drafting. So I am really looking forward to trying this again with drafting. So I'm thinking it was going to fix my main problem with it. That sounds solid. Uh, it, it's always a shame when, you know, the set crews, uh, which obviously people are going to play as their first time, that's going to be at the default to the game, is less than ideal. Uh, you know, when you've got this one and done world we live in right now for board gaming, lead with the best method. Yeah. Don't don't put a subpar method, even if it's a little easier. It's not the way you want to introduce people to the game. Yeah, you might like you put it in there as the default and then at the back say, if you want an easier game, do this. Or maybe the problem is that it's fighting the whole, you want the game to be easy enough to learn players don't give up on it before they start. So it's it's fighting that versus the one and done feel. So I don't know. I, I, I'm i on the fence with that because I think someone new to board gaming reading this probably shouldn't draft crew because the other problem is the first time you play the game, you don't know what the crew mean right. until you played. So it's really hard to draft crew when you're like, I don't know what any of this means. But I almost think like like randomly assigning crew might be better, though that might lead to unbalanced. I don't know. I, I'm on the fence, but I got to say, I, I maybe do the thing where you play the first round with the crew, but you don't finish the game. Like play it. I, I'm, no one's going to know this unless they own the game. You play it to two cubes instead of more. Like play it to two cubes, kind of get it, and then draft. Overall, though, I dig it. Um, I like rondels. Um, this to me felt bigger than it was like it felt like a bigger pickup and deliver game in a very short time frame um i liked how quick it was as well as how much it felt like we accomplished like it felt like i had very full cargo crew and i completed a lot of things in a short amount of time i will say it was way simpler and easier to learn than i expected like it's really not a complicated game um and i will say when i first started playing i was a little disappointed like i wanted to heavier meteor customize my ship board game whereas it was more like i don't know it, it, it it's it's a little lighter than that but you know what knowing that i can enjoy it for what it is this may even be a good gateway rondelle or pickup delivery game looking forward to more scorpius freighter in the future so this is a this is a 2.42 weight on board game geek with a with a it solid fuel that heavy with a solid seven uh, uh review it, although i have to say the numbers are a little low 
Um, it's, uh, you know, I see people talking about, you know, oh, they played it on the Dice Tower cruise. So, you know, there's uh, some people out there who've definitely had the, the good experience with it. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people are finding it a bit dull. You know, it's a good game, but it's just not that interesting. Yeah, that's, that's where the it, it felt like it could use a bit more. Yeah. Now, interestingly, I see people who are saying, you know, I have upgraded my rating after more plays, see, yeah, which is good, but so unlikely in this yes. day and age. All right, now, in addition to clearing some games up, piles of shame, which I guess say one particular pile just looking much lower. It's nice. Um, I did get some other game plays to the table, including a two-player game of Lost Ruins of Arnak. Um, now, we've also been playing this pretty regularly on Board Game Arena, even just starting up our first four-player game earlier this week. So thanks for joining, Jeff. Um, I'm sad to say I'm not loving this at two players, at least so far. Now, we've only done it twice, so maybe they are both outliers. But it just seems to me like once player once a player gets ahead, it's almost impossible for the other player to catch up. Now, more than two players, though, I am loving Arnak. Just two player, I don't know. Now, have you played with the Snake Temple side of the board yet? No, not Apparently, at all. Apparently, it uh, is an up uh, a more difficult right. version of the game and can act to reduce potential runaway problems. Okay. So I saw I saw some people now I didn't see people mentioning that actually three and four is where the runaway problems are more likely. Really? Um, okay. But the, but the snake temple is, again, the the mitigation to that is you up that difficulty on the snake temple side and it re, it reels in some of the uh, potential to run. away. So I don't think I played enough three and four player games at this point. Like, what have we finished? One? Yeah. Player two, uh, three maybe, player games. Yeah, I'm not sure. I uh, haven't noticed it in two and three player games, but yeah, our well, three, I mean, three or four. I'm, well, we just started our first four player. Yeah, I, I'm still, I'm still struggling again. Not having played this game physically, I think, is another major drawback. Right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning things every time and figuring things out. Uh, and again, it's also there's, there's just definitely that. The, the board game distraction, the lack of real-time play. I mm. I have to say, I'm starting to burn out on BGA a little bit. Um, you know, especially because we've done a whole bunch of these, you know, more difficult games mm. on Board Game Arena. Uh, and, and a lot of them I've never played physically and I, I don't have the familiarity with. And it's 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 getting it's tough to keep track of them. Yeah. Like you mentioned, Feast for Odin launched, and I'm like, oh, I don't even know if I want to dive into that one. I'm like, we have enough other stuff. Oh, yeah, no, on. absolutely. Yeah, D loves the fact we're now doing crunchier games. <laughs> yeah, we might have to try the Snake Temple. Maybe that's the next we try a two-player, though I, we may just hold off till we have three. Uh, next up was the game. We played the game that is from Pandasaurus Games, the cooperative game of the game, which still bugs me. Uh, we end up playing three rounds of this one. Now, I have been a fan of the game for quite a long time. I'm pleased to say that I finally sold Deanna on the game. Um, this is the one where you have a deck of cards, number two to 99, and you try to play every card in the deck with having less than 10 cards left being considered a win. Now, the trick here is that there are four piles you play on, two counting up and two counting down, and every turn you have to play two cards from your hand no matter what. Now, to help with this, there's a rule where you can stack cards that are exactly 10 apart, going the wrong way on a stack. This game is way harder than it sounds, but really enjoyable. So far, everyone in my family agrees that this is better to the mind, which has a very similar theme. You're also trying to play numbers 1 to 100 in order, in a different way. Because this game has communication is encouraged. You need to talk to each other. You need to socialize. You need to have conversations about what to do and this is just a much more social game even if you can't talk about exact card values that just has that better we're having a party we're enjoying things together feel than staring at each other waiting for someone to play a numbered card yeah no that's uh it definitely sounds like communication is is so much more of a a enjoyable part of of yeah. games you know I mean, yes there are times where those silent games can kind of work but as a family game that's not it yeah have you played that one the game yet not yet no okay i couldn't remember i've, I've owned it long enough that, that you very well might have played it 
All right, last physical game on my list is Aqualin, and I think based on the time, we're going to skip the digital plays. So I'm going to stick with Aqualin as my last game for this week. Uh, this is a game I'm still terrible at. <laughs> I do still enjoy it. Um, I personally don't think it's ever going to compete with, say, the Duke, Onitama, Patchwork, or War Chest, or Hive for my top two-player games. But I do dig this one. Uh, Deanna likes it more than I do. Um, and so does Gwen, actually. Dee and Gwen even played a game together this last week. And while seeing as D keeps beating me and Gwen keeps beating D, I don't think I'd have a chance against Gwen. So maybe that'll happen at some point. Fair enough. Uh, all I've played, uh, I did get one game of Hogwarts in with the kids since last yep. we recorded. Uh, we got into an unwinnable situation and Ooh. ended up just putting the game down and walking away from it because and it was it was our fault for doing it. But the fact that we could get to that situation was a little frustrating. So yeah, there Still, was like a, an event card that you wished you knew about ahead of time. Well, so like we you're, did you're... know about it, but we'd forgotten about it because we were having okay. such struggles with the the first card um, right. that we just got to a point where you needed to beat three villains and we didn't have three villains left on the table. That, so, one, that almost feels like there should be like an FAQ. Like if that comes up, that card's just instantly one like you've done it well no I, three it's, you've instantly lost that's the the point yeah. i think is the is the you know again this is monster box of monsters we're back into now <laughs> and we still I, I apparently ridiculous game of i have of heard peril. that the next box is easier so we right. need to get by this hump and and we we've been close uh and the kids and again you know we're losing but the kids still keep, i my daughter keeps coming home can we play nice. can we play that game again so Oh, that's that's the important part. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Well, the I, excuse me. Well, these eyes are uh, currently still in flux, so we haven't really been playing anything lately. Um, I've been playing Horizon Zero Dawn on my PlayStation a lot. Um, we've been taking turns on board game arena, but that's about it. So I'm really hoping that things stabilize uh, for this weekend. So uh, these eyes are getting better every day. So hopefully we can get in some gameplays this week. Um, the main thing I would like to play most, um, just for um, what they call a pile of obligation, for obligation's sake, is Chronicles of Avel. So because I would kind of like to review that one next week. Um, it'll depend on if both kids are here for the the weekend, which I don't know if they are or not. They may be going over to visit um, their grandmother. They may not be. I don't know. If one of them goes, we'll try a three player again. But I do need to play that four player. Um, not just because it's obligation, but I actually really enjoyed it, um, especially following up after Disney Sidekicks, uh, the disaster, I will say, with that game. It's nice to play family weight co-op that's really enjoyable for the whole family. Um, other than that, I honestly, we don't have much left. Um, I need to start playing Charterstone, but until I can get people together to start playing Charterstone, we can't start on that because it's a campaign game that needs the same players. Uh, Tori and Kat are not free this weekend, so we're not going to be diving into that yet. And honestly, I'd, like, I'd have to look at the pile of obligation. There's not a lot left. Um, I'm supposed to be getting some stuff. Um, DHL, I now owe shipping on a package in customs. So thank you for that. I hate, don't use DHL. Oh, DHL ever. is the absolute worst. Yeah. So I have something coming from DHL as soon as I pay for it, which I haven't yet. I need to do that tomorrow. Um, that's, that's on its way. Uh, we have signed up to review some other stuff. I've entered a lottery to review Stonemeyer's newest game which they're supposed to contact me if they're going to ship it. So I haven't heard anything yet. So maybe I didn't win that lottery. Um, I honestly, like, I don't even remember what's on. We'll save that for the after show. I'll look it up and see what we have left. Um, we're going to keep putting out unboxing videos. Uh, there will be a review going live on YouTube this week uh, for Quezzle. And I will try to get up the Unidragon um, Wolf Puzzle review on the blog. If we're doing a blog version, I don't even know. We said see the blog version. So I guess we kind of have to do one. <laughs> We'll, we'll write up a picture of that. Um, as for gaming, I don't know. Uh, hopefully these eyes get better and we can get back to like playing Aventuria again when she can read cards. But it is going to be a while. Play what we can. Yeah. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. First off, big welcome to Valentine Pache, the latest tabletop bellhop Patreon patron. Thank you, Valentine. Matt Lichtenwalder. Thanks, Matt. Roger Malosh. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Zopi. Thank you. Brian Sheehan. Thanks, Brian. Well, that was the double bell. 
That means my shift's coming to an end, and it's time to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, as well as earning some cool bonus content, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for this show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by on YouTube Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.